If you want to pump your body and expand your mind, there's only one place to go. Mind Pump. Mind Pump. With your hosts, Sal Stefano, Adam Schaefer, and Justin Andrews. In this episode of Mind Pump, uh, this episode we talk all about how to avoid training plateaus. Now that part of the episode starts after about 20 minutes. In the first 20 minutes, we're just having a good time talking about a lot of fun stuff. We start out by talking about grass-fed beef and other delicious meats from mm. Butcher Bo- ButcherBox. Uh, they are one of our sponsors. If you go to butcherbox.com forward slash mind pump, you'll get, ready for this, free bacon and yes. $20 off for the first uh, two months. Pretty awesome. Then we talked about a study on cannabis. My, this one blew my mind. Apparently, cannabis can cause paranoia. Can't even believe <laughs> they, it. they did a study Stop on that. Right there. Then we talked about the bird box challenge. Don't do that. That's stupid. <laughs> Don't do that. Yeah. And we talked about a study done on mice talking about uh, recovery, how active recovery is probably superior to just taking time off. And that was the 20-minute intro. The rest of this was talking all about how to change your training stimulus so that you don't plateau aside from not working out, like not being consistent. Mm-hmm. Probably the biggest problem that people run into is plateauing because their body just stops responding from the workout. And it's super frustrating. Mm-hmm. You're working your butt off in the gym. You're training really, really hard. You got great results for the first few months and now nothing at all. And it feels like you're wasting your time. Like, why am I going to the gym if my body's not changing anymore? It's not because you're not working out hard. It's mm-hmm. because you're not doing the right stuff. Um, So you will enjoy this episode. Also, MAPS Anabolic, that's our flagship program. It's a great program for people who want to build their metabolism. So if you have a slower metabolism, you want a faster metabolism so you can get leaner easier. If you want to build muscle, sculpt your body, get strong, it's a great program to get started with. It's 50% off all month long, so half off. The total price is half off. Just go to mapsfitnessproducts.com and use the code R-E-D-5-0, so that's RED50 without a space for 50% off. Also, there's a new version being released soon. It's going to look really, really nice. If you have MAPS Anabolic now or if you enroll in MAPS Anabolic this month, everybody who has Everybody's getting the new version. The new version automatically, you're going to get that automatically at no additional cost. And and we we do that with all of our programs. Um, And we do have a lot of other programs also on our site, mapsfitnessproducts.com. So for my for my kids' school, you can get. I don't know if your guys' school does this, Justin, but they have these gift cards that you can get for like stores, like Whole Foods, Safeway, whatever. And through getting them, I guess the school gets like a donation or something. Oh, that's cool. I don't know if they do that. I knew they had that for Amazon, and they had like a link back to where they could get uh, some money to kind of contribute. To yeah, the school. So, yeah. So my kids' school is like they're like, oh, minimum like four grand or something ridiculous like that. Like, holy shit. Yeah. But luckily, it's a bunch of places I would go anyway. You can get gas cards and all that stuff. So anyway, that's mm. not the story. The, the, I, I bought a bunch for Whole Foods and Safeway because I go there all the time. Uh-huh. Um, and, uh huh. And do you have to buy that all up front? For the for, it, for the year. Oh, for the year. Yeah, you- but I bought them all full front, and I just keeping all these gift cards, and and I use them because I use I go to these places anyway, like gas. You know what I mean? Right. So anyway, she goes and she buys um, grass fed steak from uh, Whole Foods, and she made it, and she's she's actually becoming a pretty good cook, so she makes a pretty good dish, and I'm eating it, and it tasted uh, grass fed meat. A lot of times has that gamey taste to it and i didn't yeah. know that she bought it from whole foods so like i'm eating it and extra tough yeah so i'm eating it and usually the meat that we get is from butcher box right and so i'm like why is this why is this taste kind of funny i'm like did you leave this out like what's going on she's like oh this is from whole foods and i completely because i'd been eating butcher box for so long I, it was good to have that contrast because i think butcher box is the best job for mm. Grass fed, grass fed yeah. just it doesn't have the same you know like corn fed meat's got that that flavor that everybody loves. Have you right? gone through all the different types of cuts that they offer? Most of them. The only one I haven't done is the stew meat one. I think it is. Oh yeah. Have you done that one? I have not done that one yet either. Yeah, actually. Um, but I'm just I'm just ordering the chicken. I haven't done like the full chicken uh, yet. And just to give that a try, because I've just kept it all pretty much- A full chicken? Steak, yeah. So you get a whole chicken. And what are you going to do with that? Bake it? Yeah, there's all kinds of dishes you, you can make you show, it to your, yeah. show it to your chickens, get them to, to be- <laughs> Act right. Hey, hey lay some just eggs. hold it up over yeah. the- Lay some eggs, the bitches. Yeah. Does this look familiar? 
Yeah. But I mean, it, 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 the contrast, because I haven't eaten grass-fed meat that wasn't butcher box in a long time. I mean, I've gone to people's houses and eaten other meat, but nobody ever buys grass-fed because it's expensive, whatever. I always got to explain that to people when I turn them on to eating grass-fed. Is like if you're if you're buying it because you think it's going to taste better than the shit that's corn fed and, and full of shit, like it's not gonna taste Mm-mm. taste yeah. better. That's what made Butcher Box so special was for the that was the first time I had grass fed beef that I was like, Oh, this is actually really good. Mm-hmm. It, the ribeye is what I that's the one I that's the one I always eat. Yeah. Is the ribeye that they have. No, I don't know because we ordered salmon as well. So they they actually have. Salmon. I do their chicken too. Their chicken, their bacon. How do you like the chicken? Because I, I love haven't it. tried it yet. Oh, I love yeah. it. Yeah, well, that's the. I, I love their chicken. So we, the chicken, and then the the ribeyes, and then also what's they call the the fillet cut different. What's it called? Do you remember the name of it, Doug? Oh, it's yeah. it's the top cap, cap. or something yes. like that. Yeah. Yes. Mm. So we order that a lot, which mm. is basically just a fillet. It's a fillet cut, you mm. know. So I did. We we do this thing now with chicken where. Because you know, I, I don't. I try not to eat gluten because I sometimes have a sensitivity to it. And Jessica is now finding that she she does as well. So she bought this uh, this panko breadcrumbs that were gluten free. Yeah, we always use those. This the blue, the gluten free ones. Yeah, we do that with, uh, and that's how we bread our like our fish and stuff. It's so good on what's, fish. What's the brand? It's, it's the, panko. No, but it's a uh, yeah, but isn't it uh, Udi's? Is it Udi's? Oh, I don't know. I thought panko is the panko is not the name of the brand. No, I think panko is the style. Oh, of, am I right, Doug? Is it the style of bread? It's cr- actually panko, oh. which is uh, <laughs> pa, pa, pan, 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 pan means bread in Japanese, and ko is means small pieces of bread, basically. So, uh-huh. <laughs> so panko. It's actually panko. panko. So anyway, we bought some uh, gluten free panko, yeah. and uh, <laughs> and she just she breaded the chicken in it, and she added her own seasoning yeah, yeah. and shit. Because she wanted to make that's bomb. She wanted to make uh, chicken parmigiana, and uh, and then of course we ma- we have the homemade sauce that we make every year at my mom's house. Put that on there. Ooh, oh, oh dude, shit. I, I ate. <laughs> bro, you invite me over, bro. I ate. I'm not making this up. This is not a. This is not a joke. I ate about a. I don't know. Almost two pounds of chicken by myself. Wow. Yeah. Just ate a whole bunch of chicken. So good wow. though. And then I farted and a, a feather came out. That was hey. actually a, that's like a staple uh, go to when I was competing because it was it's really when you look at the the macro breakdown on that it's really not bad at all. Mm. It really isn't. And no, it's, it's ta- not. And it tastes funny. It gives you this feeling like you're getting like a fried piece of chicken or a fried piece well, of fish. Well, how do you guys do it? Do you guys bake it? So we do the. She does the fish. But now, do you guys bake it or do you guys pan, pan fry it? Pan fry it. Okay, so that's what she did with the chicken. So what yeah. she did with the chicken is <clears throat> she pan fried it, which I got another interesting factoid. Pan fried it, but didn't cook it all the way through that way. Just fry, fry, and then puts bake the it. skillet uh, in the oven mm. and then bakes it. Mm. So it's not like deep fried. It's just, mm. psh, psh, you know what I mean? And then puts it under. It comes out really factoid. good. Factoid. So here's the thing. We, we were having this conversation about uh, frying, and Jessica's like, you, you know, I what oil should I use? And my mom's like, use olive oil. She's like, no, I heard you're not supposed to cook with yeah, olive oil at high cook. temperature. This right. and that. So I asked, um, uh, what's, uh, Max, Max Lugavere, because he had told me a while ago that it's really not that big of it. He said, first of all, he said, frying isn't good regardless. He said, but the one, the, the fats you want to stay away from are the processed vegetable oils. He says, uh, uh, you know, a, a quick fry in olive oil, not that big of a deal. So her and I went back and forth and I texted him about it. And he said, I'll read you what he said. Because I, I thought like you should never yeah, cook no, with high temperature. I've been told that yeah, multiple times. Yeah. So he said, um, he said, he said, no, it's most, he says it's, it's, it's still stable. He said there's still a, a certain percentage of saturated fat in there. And he says, plus uh, extra virgin olive oil has antioxidants to protect it. So he says he thinks that it's largely a myth that was perpetrated by seed oil companies. Oh, wow. really? Yeah. Ooh. So I don't think you More should. More foul play. I don't think you here. should deep fry an olive oil. Yeah. He didn't say that, but he's like, yeah, it's not that big of a deal. It's got antioxidants in it. It's not like you're. Oh, that's it interesting because I've heard that a lot. Yes, huh. same. So it's the it's the other stuff you don't want to use to you know like grapeseed oil and shit like that that you want to stay away from. Oh, that's fascinating. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So anyway, so uh, I got a study here that's gonna blow your mind. Ooh, you guys ready for this? I love Let's hear when that happens. This is, uh, you know how every once in a while they publish a study that uh, after you, you read the title, you go, really? Did you guys really have to do a study? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> like the last one you did about women? Yeah, that they're yeah. mean to each other. Yeah. So this was this was a study uh, published uh, in The Guardian in the psychology section. Doug actually shared it in our 
our team group text. Oh, I think I looked at this one. Yeah, this is the title. Ready for the title? Yeah. Yeah. Cannabis really can trigger paranoia. Oh, yeah. I saw this (laughs) Apparently a a large study. (laughs) It's confirmed, everybody. On the effects of THC suggests, I like how they put suggests just to be safe, that it can cause paranoia in vulnerable individuals. Why do we, why do we even what? spend money on studies like this? I don't. Yeah, I don't know. I don't. I, I don't get it. I think it's like I mean anybody who's smoked, especially for the first time. I mean that's that's the big concern. It's like it's back in the day. I remember like there was no mm. such thing as like dosing. So you just like take a as massive a hit as you possibly could, and it was just. I mean, it was anxiety city. You know, that was like what I steered me away from it forever. If you have, if you're somebody who who uses a lot of cannabis and you have anxiety, I probably think, not a good idea. Yeah, it's gonna think, hype it up. I think you should probably reduce your cannabis consumption. <laughs> yeah, you know, we had uh, what's that guy's name from Leafly? God, I forgot his name. We just had him on the show. Uh, Will. Yes, uh, thank you. What's his last name? I can't think of it. Right uh, let, let us know, Doug. So I want to make sure we, we say his name right. Um, good guy, right? Really, really good guy. But he said, yeah, he goes, cannabis doesn't cause paranoia. It's just the, the fear of getting caught with it that causes paranoia. I've heard stoners say that before. <laughs> not saying that he's a stoner, um, but I think he would say he is, right? Self-proclaimed or whatever. That's not true. Of course it, of course it causes that shit in some people. Like yeah. any yeah. any substance. I think what his, his statement was that it's perpetuated, though, by the, all the other stuff. That you could get caught, that it, it's, it's a drug you're taking. So I think it's heightened because of that. Mm-hmm. Because I know that the first time that I, the first really bad experience like that I had with it, um, I mean, it freaked me out and absolutely, I would say, 100% causes paranoia. Now, being somebody who's used it for several years now, I've been beyond that level of high before and totally comfortable with it because I'm comfortable with the mm-hmm. feeling. Like, so a lot of it is. Have you ever gotten to a, sp- a place, mm-hmm. though, where you'll, you'll use, will, will hide? Thank you, Doug. You ever get to a place though where you'll use it, and let's say you're you're kind of stressing over something, and you're a little worried or whatever, and then you have some, and then it just makes those those thoughts worse. Has that ever happened to you? Oh yeah, right. Yeah, that no, happens to me. No, I absolutely. So I, I I do agree that it does create it, but I also believe you know in his defense that you know a, much of that is cre- we have cre- we create ourselves, like, sure, to, and that's what perpetuates that feeling of paranoia, and the more that you become comfortable and okay with this, yeah, this well and it was illegal you know and so there is that element to right. it where you're trying to be sneaky and it's you know going into it so i'm sure that can right and you think you're thinking everybody thinks you're high right like oh, yeah God, i don't want i don't want people <laughs> I don't to, want to talk to my parents right now ah! yeah, yeah yeah so no <laughs> think, it's yeah. so funny but i think that the thing that i that i said in the thread that i want to communicate is true for what i'm about to say is true for any substance that has an effect on you. Right. If, if something has an effect on you, then it literally affects you. And that means that mo- a lot of things are not off the table. Everything's kind of on the table. So it's, you know, when someone's like, oh, caffeine can't do this to you. Well, it definitely has an effect on you. And we don't know how your body chemistry is reacting, your state of mind, right. the context. A-, a lot of these these things can affect you in a lot of different ways. And so to say that something will never cause you know, because I've heard people say that before. Oh no, it relaxes me. It'll never make anybody anxious. Well, it does something to you, obviously. Yeah. So, in the right individual with the right circumstance, because I've had some situations where <laughs> most terrifying situations of my life yeah, were yeah. with cannabis. Oh yeah, or you get like news and you're and you're high at the time. That are, that's like it, it makes you just like oh freak out. Like it's gonna in, intensify that whole that yeah. whole news oh, that man. process. <laughs> like oh my god. <laughs> right. I, did you I guys that. did you guys end up watching uh, Bird Box yet? No, I haven't. I've heard it's. Mm. I heard it's like really creepy, but it's not super scary. Which I've been trying to sell this to Courtney because I know, like, we we watched Hill House. Seriously, one of my favorite shows of last year. So smart. I thought they yeah, killed that it was show. Very smart. Amazing writing. So, and I've heard good things about Bird Box. Do you? Where would you compare the two? It's Bird Box is a thriller. More than it is scary. Okay, you know what I mean. Was Hill House scarier? Sc- uh, pro- yeah, yeah, parts because of the ghosts and everything. Yeah, because of the ghosts like and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Have you seen? You didn't watch Hill House either? No, no. Uh, you would actually like it. I think you would like it. You would like it. How the fuck do you guys say a statement like that and then follow it up with "I would like it"? No, 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 no. I, because it's there's only there's parts where it's like you know it's coming, but or you don't. But it's it's I fun. Don't, it's not, it's no. not like no. 
No. <laughs> no, no, no. No, no, <laughs> it's not fun. I don't like to feel anxious watching a movie. <laughs> have you have you so, watched I don't know how many times I gotta say this. Maybe right, you should uh, reduce right, your uh, weekend. We, we always forget. No. <laughs> sober, <laughs> high, doesn't matter. Yeah, you gotta watch it cold, stone, sober. Well let me yeah. ask you this. Yeah. Do, do you do you like movies like um did you ever watch Seven with uh Love Seven. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So so that movie was a thriller, right? What about um Silence of the Lambs? Liked it little on, little on the scary on the edge okay. there. Yeah, you're, you're, that part in the dark, bro. When he's walking around, that's or when she's walking around in the dark is one of the yeah, scariest yeah. scenes of all you'll, movies. You'll, you'll, <laughs> oh, yeah. No, you'll like Hell House be, yeah. and Bird Box because the writing is so good and it's along those lines. You'll, that's why you'll like them. But anyway, <clears throat> in the movie Bird Box, highly recommend. I think they did an excellent job. They oh, here side note: uh, Jessica was getting her hair cut, and this the kid was uh, was talking about Bird Box. Like, yeah, the. The lead woman in there, man, she did such a good job. And who is this actress? And it's like Sandra Bullock. <laughs> Come on, you know Sandra Bullock? Yeah, yeah. No, he was already. A, he was uh, in relevant. his 20s. So yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. That's hilarious. <laughs> She's like, you never watched Speed? He's like, huh? Yeah. So anyway, um, uh, the- This congeniality? Hello? In the movie, they're blindfolded throughout a lot of the movie. I'm not going to tell you why, but they have to move around. And it was, well, they tell it in the trailer, so it's not like a Yeah, spoiler. but you don't know why. Okay. You don't all know right, why that, right. that is. Fine. It, which is part of the writing, which I thought was brilliant, because it was a great way to add that element uh, of all like, right, I'm, oh, I'm shit. more interested now. Super good. But anyway, in the movie, they have to move around blindfolded outside and they have to find their way around. So now you've got a bunch of idiots. Of course, we're in the Tide Pod generation. You've got a <laughs> bunch of idiots now who oh, are doing the bird man. box uh, <clears throat> challenge. Oh, God. So, what, like, what are the stipulations with this? What are, like, the, so obviously they're wearing a blindfold, but what are they trying to do while they're wearing a blindfold? Uh, anything. Any, just any. Any reason yeah, to do it? Drive the car. No. Walk around. Do things outside. Yeah, driving. Because in the movie they have to drive blindfolded. Also, um, a couple parts. So they so people are trying wow. to do the birth. Yeah, people yeah. are so smart. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> what do you think is gonna happen? That's if like you're- Ghost riding the Whip. Remember that whole no, thing no, where totally. they would like no. step out of their car. That's why just- I guess I guess when I roll my eyes like that, I, I try not to sound like or look or sound like the old like guy, the old daddy. right? The old yeah. guy because we did a lot of stupid shit in our generation yeah, too. We did, and I think that I think we just makes us sound old when we think about. What this. did we do that was it's different? That dumb though. Well, Justin, just name one. I remember yeah. Ghost Ride the Whip. Yeah, That's not our generation. I mean, sure it was. No, tail end of it. That it was, was the tail end of it. It was the tail end of it. it was Ghost a- Ride the Whip was not, that was what, like we 2005 were, we, maybe? It was, was in it? A, I feel like it was like How late old 90s. Were you? No, it wasn't. Doug, like look up Ghost Ride like the Whip. 99 maybe. 99? No, it's after 99. Uh, yeah, it's definitely it's after high school. 2000. It was, yeah, 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 it's, right. it's, it's after high school, but I mean, that's still considered our general. I was listening I to that song. Yeah. Maybe. You know what I'm saying? I listened to that song. Yeah. I definitely, on my way from the clubs. I mean, yeah. I remember that, you yeah. know? And I remember a bunch of people in front of us doing that at two o'clock in the morning. Mm. Yeah. There it is, ghostwriting. What year is it, Doug? Yeah, let's find out. Because uh, I don't remember yeah, that Anything one. with cars and motorcycles. 2006. Doing these tricks no is way. always a bad idea. Hmm. But yeah, we did. Does that we say 2006? We yeah, I just said that, but I don't know if it said that's when it started. Yeah, yeah we did. We did very uh, close, Sal. And it's too, it's kind of, so think about how there old you were you? There you go, Doug. Ghost Ride the Whip. Right? Does, was it say 2006? Yeah, how old were you guys at wow. 2006? 16. No, no, shut 99 up. was when we graduated from high school. So that's seven years out of high school. So you're 26. Right. Yeah, so you're in your 20, you're in your mid 20s. By yeah. that point, you're not really. It's not your generation anymore, yeah. right? Yeah, fair enough. Yeah, our generation didn't do. Well, then again, it kind of is though, because you can't drive till you're 16. So mm-hmm. you know, you're not ghost riding the whip at. 13. <laughs> you yeah. have to be at least yeah, you 16. Gotta have at least a driver's I feel license. like 16 to 25 would be the, the generation. So we, we were right. Like Justin hit it right. We're on yeah. the tail end of that. Yeah. That's we, per, that was we were, pretty dumb. Yeah. We were, we were on the tail end. Uh, that's just anyway, one thing. That's there's just a lot, one thing. Yeah. yeah there's there's plenty of other examples. There's a lot of stupid, stupid shit. We were talking about remember that last pod, one of that last podcast yeah, episode. passing to, people out and. Uh, yeah. Yeah. See, we did doing that. Smoking whatever we could find. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I smoked, I smoked <laughs> oregano out of a plastic big pen. Out of a plastic big pen. We melted the bottom of it and then we smoked oregano. You know, that guy's be one of the stupidest things we what ever did. What are you even doing? Yeah. Yeah. Dude, I wanted to bring up a, a, a fitness study that's kind of interesting. The title of the study, and I'll explain kind of a little bit about what it means. Responses of skeletal muscle size and anabolism are reproducible with multiple periods of unloading and reloading. And so what they did is they tested rats where they basically exercised them and then had them stop. Had them exercise, had them stop. It's like they, a little rat wheel. I don't know how they even yeah. work them out. Little, little real rat weights. Yeah, I think, <laughs> I think that's what it is. <laughs> but what they found was that collagen concentrations uh, in the muscles uh, changed pretty significantly 
when they took a long break versus rather than just to, and because when you when you take a break and then start up again, your muscles bounce back pretty fast. But what they're saying is when you do that, each time you do that, you increase your risk of injury pretty highly versus staying just a little bit active in between, which kind of enforces the idea that we talk about all the time of active recovery. Rather than right. just taking time off completely, right. mm-hmm. you're probably better off going really easy and really light but still moving. So not doing the whole not working it out, you know, not working out type of thing. Because when you bounce back, they're saying that that risk of injury goes up now, d- it, quite a bit. Is, is was that a study done on like just rats or do- <laughs> just rats? Okay, yeah, so we don't know. Rats. We don't know what. But that- well, we've observed because I feel stuff. like that would be uh, there would be a major variance between uh, age groups too. Oh, of course, man. right? Like yeah. that, I, I would I would think that, that would be extremely important as you start to get beyond 30, 40 years old. That you know you're better off. At least doing like some active recovery mobility. Like I'm thinking about myself right now. Like it's something that I've done. I I haven't been on my rigorous training program, Mm -hmm. but I've definitely still moving weights, still doing mobility type exercises and drills. And because I know, like if I don't, I lock and stiffen up. And well, what it makes me think about. It's not a kid anymore. I'm not playing on a playground anymore. Playing pickup basketball. I'm not doing these things that I think that would promote that that you typically do when you're in your teens. Well, what it makes me think about is you know how they they say that when uh, people go on a, a cycle of anabolic steroids and their muscles get really strong and big, that their risk of injury goes up because all of the connective tissue and Mm -hmm. tendons Mm -hmm. and all the other tissues that need to strengthen take longer. So the muscle gets real strong and big faster than the support structures can keep up. I've I've always wondered about that. Yeah, because I've wondered about people taking anabolic steroids and I've always heard ligaments, uh, you know, not being able to grow at the same pace as, you know, the muscles. And mm-hmm. why, you know, why that is, is it, is it low like, blood flow? Yeah. I was going to say a, a, a blood flow issue or. Yeah. And muscles hypertrophy faster than tendons and ligaments can, or at least uh, uh, when you take anabolic steroids. Now, here's the thing. When you exercise, let's say you gain, let's say you've worked out for two years consistently. You do a really good job. You eat a good diet. You gain 15 pounds of lean body mass, right? You put 15 pounds of muscle on your body, which is a lot. And then let's say you just totally stop working out for four or five months, you're going to lose, you'll lose that 15 pounds of muscle in a pretty quick period. What, what, what it made it, t- it might've took you a year and a half to gain it. It'll be gone in, in, in four or five months of total deactivity. But then when you go back to working out, it's not going to take you a year and a half to gain that muscle back. It comes back really fast. Like we've all experienced muscle memory. So my question or what it makes me think about is maybe the muscles bounce back fast, but then the tendons and ligaments take long to come back. So they don't keep up at the same pace, which is why taking these breaks and then working out may not be as good as at least maintaining some form of activity. Do you see mm. what I'm saying? Mm. That's my that would be my theory. I don't know. No, I'll what, do you, what do you think about maybe uh, I, I don't know. This is just total speculation of like the style of training in terms of like people that are on anabolic steroids and doing like very concentric focused, you know type lifts and, um, you know, aren't really incorporating mobility and blood flow to the joints quite as much. I I think the, 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 the faster you progress and the stronger you get, the more important, uh, mobility is, uh, I mean, obviously you're, you're, there's more output, more power, right? You know what I'm saying? Well, I just, uh, in terms of like getting blood flow, like that could increase the potential to, you know, have them be affected. Well, we, we incorporate like split, you know, map split was a, was a pretty much a bodybuilder routine. Yeah. And we made sure to put one day of, of just mobility work right? because, um, two, oh, well, two things. First off an injury, Nothing will make you lose your gain. You know, nothing will, will will get in the way of your gains or progress more than an injury. That's right. the worst possible thing that can happen. And then number two, being being able to move through wider ranges of motion with good control is only going to contribute to, to more your muscle. to your ability to build more muscle. Mm-hmm. So it's it, the, the irony of that, of course, is bodybuilders do the least amount of mobility, right? Uh, but they probably they will benefit from it just like any other athlete, even for their sport, which is just to look good. You yeah. know. That actually brings me on, a, on another topic. Um, I want to see if you guys wanted to kind of talk about on this episode. I did a post just now um, on Instagram, and um, every once in a while I'll, I'll I'll do a post, and you'll I'll just see that it, it kind of hits a nerve and gets a lot of attention real quick. And so the post that I did the the, the was it was just a words right. I just wrote some words on a meme or whatever, and it said 
Muscle building rule number one. Almost everything works, but nothing works forever. And so the case that I made in the post that a lot of people seem to be sharing is how, you know, if you took if you took all accepted uh, muscle building techniques, like the, the, all the accepted ones, not the crazy ones, but all the kind of accepted ones, they all, they'll all have an effect, especially on somebody who's never done them before. They're all going to build muscle. Mm-hmm. But there isn't a single one, if it was just done all the time, the same all the time, that will always work. Your body will eventually yeah. plateau um, with anything. doesn't matter. Well, what and it. I think that really is like sort of the root of the problem of what we see mm-hmm. in terms of like everybody being so fervorous about their specific modality and I their agree. camp. And uh, because there is that initial uh reaction or progress or you know what what they found in terms of like getting some kind of results and success uh but yeah exactly there 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 is a shelf life to that if that's your only uh driving force yeah now i mean before we get into kind of what that looks like and and you know why that works and why you need to change things up i think it's important that cuz i i think a lot of people now have heard that you need to mix things up you need to confuse the muscles i hate when they say that and um, I think we should talk about the wrong way to do it because I see a lot of people who they're like, oh, I go to the gym and it's different every single time I work out. That was me. Yeah, that was me for a long time. And the hard thing is to convince someone like me during that time that it was wrong because I built decent muscle. I looked pretty good, felt pretty damn good. And so if you were to come to me and say, hey, what you're doing is not ideal or it's not right. I would pretty much tell you to fly a kite. Um, and, I, and I think that's the problem that a lot of people are in right now. If you're not somebody who's beginning and just totally oblivious to what, what you're doing, if you're somebody who's been training for years, I think this is one of the common mistakes. To Justin's point, I think that so at one point in your fitness journey, you try out some modality or training philosophy and you see great change or you see a great response. Your body is, you become the, the best shape or the best version that you've ever seen of yourself. Therefore, someone trying to tell you that that's not ideal or that's not working or there's other things out there you should incorporate. Yeah, because you're identifying. You're like, well, it worked for me. Right, yeah. I mean, there's no way Sal's going to convince me to stop training this way because this I've seen myself in the best shape of my life doing this. The reality of it is there is there is a there is a better way to do it. And, you know, I, I definitely learned that firsthand after many years of training this way with the, you know, quote unquote muscle confusion type mm-hmm. of uh, idea of lifting where I every time I in fact, I used to brag about this. I used to say to people that, you know, I've never duplicated a workout. You know, every time I come in and lift, it's never looked exactly the same. I'm constantly shocking my body and throwing a new adaptation at it, which, you know, that's really silly when you think about it. If I wanted to see maximum gains, uh, I I should have phased it and I, I should have been more strategic. And when I started to do that, wow, what a difference yeah. did that make? So there is some truth. To, and there's some benefits to the, the the muscle confusion type of theory that, that people apply where they're changing their workout all the time because, yes, the body's going to be challenged. Yes, you're going to burn all these extra calories. Yes, you're stimulating muscle. Yes, you're going to see results from that. But there is a much more methodical approach that will result in better results if, if you can structure your well, workout. Well, so I'm experiencing this a, a little bit right now. So something that I just recently started doing with my training that I haven't done in a long time um, is uh, train to failure. Now, I know I, we've said many times on the show, train to failure is too much intensity for most people most of the time. And we always say that, most people most of the time. But it is a novel stimulus uh, every once in a while. And you have to, me- you know, you modify the other um, you know, variables, right? So if I go to failure, my volume goes way down. Mm-hmm. Rather than doing, you know, three, set, uh, three sets of three exercises for a body part, for example, which would be nine total sets, I'll do three exercises, one set to failure of each exercise. So I've cut the volume way down, but now my intensity is through the roof. And because I haven't doing, done it in a, in a long time, my body, my body starts to see results. But here's the thing with this, is, and this is the way I explain it to people. When you look at a variable in exercise or, or training, whether it be rep ranges, uh, rep tempo, even the exercises themselves, so like different movements for legs or chest or back, 
um, whether whether you know the, you know, different kinds of splits. Like there's a there's a lot of different variables, but those are the main ones that I, I just named. You know, number of sets, all that stuff. When you look at those variables, look at them in terms of their potential. And there's an upper limit of potential that you can achieve through each of those variables, and there's a lower limit of potential. And in order to reach the upper limit of potential for any variable, you have to do it long enough to where you at least adapt to the point where you can maximize that variable. So what I mean by that is a very easy example. Let's say I always train in the very low rep ranges. Let's say I never go above five reps. And I've just been doing it for years. And then I hear this podcast. I'm like, oh, wow, I'm supposed to mix things up. Let me try training in the 20 rep range. The first couple weeks of doing 20 reps, you're not able to push 20 reps very hard because you're out of gas. Mm -hmm. You're not able to do it well. Right. So you're not able to squeeze out the maximum potential of those 20 reps. Now, let's say you do the 20 reps for four months. Well, not only did you get good at it, but your body stopped responding because it's no longer a novel stimulus. And that's, I think, what we need to kind of address because... Well, there's a sweet spot. There is. And, 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 there's, there, and there's a variance in that sweet spot. And I think this is also, you know, how we came up with that three to four week range with all the programs is that, you know, based off of our experience and knowledge that, you know, most people fall in that range of three to four weeks that they want to stay with a specific adaptation. That way, they break through that initial phase of learning the movement, building the stamina, getting good at it enough to where they can actually push it, mm -hmm. which I think results in the back three and four week, right? So week one and two of a training uh, you know, modality is, you know, or a phase, whatever, your, your first two weeks is a lot of learning the movement, getting good at it, building the gas tank. If it's a high rep, like you're saying, if it's a, if it's a low rep, then maybe it's more skill driven, getting mm -hmm. really good at the skill, summoning the amount of force. Right, necessary. right. Exactly. So getting good at that skill. And then the, the weeks three and four is really, you're pushing it, pushing it, maximizing what, what you've been leading up to. And then the mistake that I think a lot of people is they tend to go weeks five, six, seven, and eight because just as they start to get really good at it and see great performance and and physical change from it, they get and they fall in love with it and then they want to stick with it. But in reality, after they start to see that initial really good change, it would be most ideal for you to kind of phase out of it. That's the hardest part. The hardest part is knowing when to phase out of a particular style of training or whatever variable you're messing with because our tendency is to phase out when we stop progressing. So it's like, I'm doing so good in these low reps, I'm just going to stay here mm -hmm. until my body stops responding. Well, usually what it looks like is you stay in the low reps, then you have a week where you don't add more weight, and then you think, I'll try again next week. And then you have another week where you don't hit the new weight, and you're like, well, one more week, I'm going to try one more time. Then you're, okay, fine, I need to get out of this phase. Well, now you've plateaued hard for three weeks. Getting out of a plateau is like getting out of a hole. Once you hit that plateau, you're in a little bit of a hole, and the hard, the longer you start, you stay in that hole, the harder it is to come out to the oh, yeah. point where if I have somebody who's been in a hole for a long time just driving their body, not responding, sometimes I got to give them two or three weeks of deloading before I move them into something else. Mm -hmm. Ideally, you want to move out of – you want to change your routine right after the peak of your progress. So if I'm in a new rep range and I'm hitting PRs and I feel amazing – and the next week I work out, and I still do better, but I notice it's starting to slow down. Right around that time is when you might want to consider changing phases. And for most people, that looks like three, five weeks, maybe six weeks, depending That's on the right. I would say three to six. Yeah. I would say max six. Very few people you're going to see you know, continuing to hit PRs beyond week six uh, of a training phase. And three is on the lower end of your body. So I think most of the programs that we've set up are, are staged around three because it's not going to hurt you to move right. on sooner. You know what I'm saying? Right. If you move away from it, it's there's more bad things that happen by prolonging it. Prolonging it is when you start to notice the hard plateaus, the aches that you start to get. That that there's tend to and the risk of oh, injury. Yeah. And you press it more because you get more confident in you know the the newly acquired skill, and so you're you're going for those PRs, and that's you know where we get susceptible to to you know injury or anything mm -hmm. like that. So the other thing too is uh, you know if you're if let's say you're 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 doing an elimination diet for yourself, and you're trying to figure out what 
the fuck is bothering me? Why do I have you know this skin issue or why am I getting headaches or why do I have gut issues? The way an elimination diet works is you eliminate all the variables and you introduce one variable at a time so that you can identify the culprit, right? You don't just throw a bunch of shit at yourself and then you don't know what the fuck's working, what's not working, right, and what's right. going on. This is how you should approach your training. And it's not to figure out what's working and what's not working. Really, it's to maximize each of these variables. So what I mean by that is the one of the best ways to change up your routine, and this isn't the only way because there's a lot of different ways you can do it, but one of the best ways I like to do is I like to work on one variable at a time. Right. So I'm changing the reps. I'm going to keep all the same exercises. And then I'm changing exercises. And then... I'm going to focus on a different adaptation. Maybe it's right. mobility. And Changing then, the rest. Yeah, and you can start messing with these things and seeing how your body responds. It's also important to note that some variables can stay in longer than others. Rep ranges, you tend to move those in and out of those every three to six weeks. Exercises sometimes last for a long time. Like, And why? Because there's such a... There's such a learning curve. There's such a skill acquisition process. Well, not just that, but there's also huge carryovers from certain movements, i.e., deadlifting, squatting, right. bench press, overhead press. Right. Those are staple movements that should pretty much stay in your program almost forever. Right. Because, and we, we we've touched on this a little bit on 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 previous shows that you know, and this was a, this back to my mistake, right? So take go back ten years when I was lifting and muscle confusion guy and you know training legs you know i i want first of all i was only training legs one time a week uh, maybe two two was like just uh, would kill me because i was going to failure and doing all these things but you know i might squat on one of those one of those days and then i'm leg pressing on another and then the following week i'm mm -hmm. doing hamstring curls and leg extensions and machine hack squats and i'm using every every piece of equipment in there and maybe in a month's time, I squatted once, maybe twice, mm -hmm. you know, for my legs. And then I did all these other little, little movement, isolation type exercises, which is so silly because just simply squatting and doing nothing else has blown my legs up more than anything else. And I could do, you know, half of the time in the gym just lifting that movement and get, you know, four or five times the gains on my legs than throwing all these random leg exercises at my legs and killing myself. Right. So then you'll get people who will be like, oh, but I thought you said you should mix it up. Why would you always squat, right? And one of them is the carryover. But the other one is certain movements require a lot of skill and you are not going to master the squat and you're not going to hit full plateau on a squat in three to six weeks. It takes years of, of squatting. Uh -huh. I mean, it took... It, it, I, if I train somebody uh, who's even has normal mobility, I'm not even talking about the average person with terrible mobility, somebody who can kind of move and stuff, and I start squatting with them today, they're not going to be really fucking good at squatting for like six months. It takes a while. At, at least, I would push longer than that. I think that, you know, I've been squatting my whole my whole lifting career, but very infrequently. I've been squatting two to three times a week for the last four or five years. I still think I'm making continuous improvements right so, so depending I, on the movement um it, it, you, you can keep it in there for a long time because it's such a high skill yeah. movement unlike a low skill movement is it going to make that big of a difference if i just do barbell curls all the time or i go do another kind of curl that's not that it's not that important it's a low skill exercise yeah. you, you well, master I, it pretty quickly and also i think you know mastering your energy system like and being efficient with that in terms of the principle of specificity like i believe like in my opinion i feel that is one of the principles of training that is has been lost and ha people have just thrown that concept out even though it's like a proven principle you're you need to specifically tell your body what to do in order for it to adapt accordingly this is the 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 amount of stress that i'm telling my body it, it is needs to overcome in order to get better and more effective at it has a certain amount of time you need to teach that to it and not convolute it with 
uh, for instance, like making something more of an endurance based exercise. So now I'm upping my rep count while I'm simultaneously doing something for power for a few reps. And so now the body's it, that muscle confusing is really is it's it's confusing all the <laughs> energy systems to right, right. be efi- efficient and give you what you want. It's so, like the 80 20 rule, right? I mean, 80 percent of your effort, energy and time should be focused on the things that are going to give you the greatest bang and buck, mm-hmm. you know, bang for your buck the other 20 percent can be done with these you know isolation different exercises and variables in your routine but there should be these core staple movements where most of your time and energy is spent no that's a good uh, what you said justin was a good point because uh i think a lot of times people will think okay monday is heavy day tuesday is light high rep day wednesday is Mm -hmm. you know speed or whatever and in my experience, unless you're, and now this isn't true for hundred for everybody. Like if I'm training an MMA fighter, um, if we're off season, yeah. this is true. But if we're during season, I got to keep them in being able to do all the stuff, right? But for most people, you're better off training in blocks where I'm power. Yeah. I'm going to get good at power. I'm going to wait till my body gets good. I get used to the movements. I get good at them. I can push them. Oh, my progress is slowing down. Now I'm going to move to you know, endurance, or now I'm going to move to bodybuilding or aesthetic type training. And rather than mixing it all up in the same week where your body has only limited resources and an ability to adapt. Like if I train for endurance and strength at the same time, I'll get a little bit of each, but a lot of neither. Yeah. You know, and it's harder to kind of break apart again, what's really working well for my body. And then it's, it's also hard to manage your recovery. Because it's it really like it, sometimes that that might delay the process. Like uh, you might need more recovery than you even realize because like everything is is trying to uh, figure it out. Like exactly what kind of stress you're inducing, like mm-hmm. on a daily basis. Yeah. So, so I, I think you know when you're when you're looking at your workout and your routine, and you're trying to wonder why, and and this is important because I think for a long time now, um, exercise routine programming has kind of lost, people have kind of devalued it. Like, oh, as long as you're working out hard, does it make a difference? Well, because they've been marketed too differently. Yeah. And it's all about your diet. It's all about your- Right. It's so it's- it's not sexy, mm-hmm. and we're not told that. We're there's not a lot of money in that. The money is in selling you a, a supplement that yeah. you're going to try and but take. Like, hey, if you're sweating, you're fine. But if you buy this supplement from us, that'll make all the difference in the world. <laughs> right. In my experience, when it comes to building muscle and athletic performance, now fat loss, of course, diet makes a big difference. And if your diet's terrible, it ruins everything. But in my experience, when someone's not getting stronger, not and they're not improving their performance and not building muscle, it's their workout. Yeah, it's almost always. It's, a, it's their workout is it's off. And if you're if that's if that's you, you know, if you're listening right now and you're and you've been working out and you think you're doing everything right and you're just plateauing, rather than looking at should I take the next new creatine or should I add more more protein to my diet or should I cut my carbs or maybe I, rather than doing that, look at your workout. And if you if you write your workout out for the last six months and it looks kind of the same. And what I mean by that is same kind of rep ranges, similar tempo, exercises kind of look the same. It's not really that different. Change it and then watch what happens. I I mean, I experienced this so many times as a kid trying to build muscle and I never learned my lesson because something would work and I get stuck on that thing. And I think, oh, this is the answer. And I realize, oh, this is not working anymore. I got to try something different. It happened to me the first time I read uh, Mike Menser's Heavy Duty, which you know, told me super high intensity, super low volume. I did that and oh my God, all this muscle. And then I got stuck on that and then that stopped working. And then it was like, oh, I'm going to try this super high volume approach. And then that worked and that stopped. And Mm -hmm. then I'd mess around with rep ranges. And I remember the first time I I really focused on doing sets of like one to three reps, like a power lifter. And I just built all this muscle. Do you you think that more people are like that? Or do you think more people are like how I am? I think that the muscle confusion thing got so popular that there's more people that are like me because mm-hmm. at least this is what I run into. I talk to a lot of probably a lot of my peers in the physique world and, and guys that I know that are trying to build muscle uh, and, and girls that are trying to build muscle. And most of them are aware of the importance of changing your routine up. Um, but what most of them fall in the category of, of, of like me where you were ch- you're changing it up with no rhyme or reason. It's just you're throwing new things at the body all the time, and yeah. you know you let. And this is what this is what used to drive me crazy when I was competing is 
all my my buddies wanted to train with me and I didn't want to train with them because they what the way they decide a workout is they let different guys lead. Mm. You know, there's three of us. I'll do we, that today. We all yeah. lift together, you know, and it's like, hey, it's chest day, and it's like, hey, Sal, you led last time. Last time, Justin, you lead this time, yeah. and then Justin just throws his favorite fucking yeah. five exercises at, at at me, and we do it. And there's no it's all power based. Yeah. Well, yeah, it, may, <laughs> it might be su- Yeah, it might be super setting. It might be low rep, high rep. It doesn't. It's not. There's. It's just you're trying to get at get me. Yeah. And that's how a lot of these people train inside the gym. That's why they like gym partners, and they b- bounce off each other. It's your turn to lift now, mm. or your turn to lead, and then it's my turn to lead problem with that is you're throwing all this stuff at it and back to your point and this is what i'm saying what i was saying i would challenge these people to follow a more structured program for three to six weeks well like, it doesn't just stop there and I, that's interesting that y- you know you see that in that world as well but i mean it's very prevalent in boot camps in oh, you know any kind of circuit training crossfit orange theories it's you know, more pre- prevalent it's, those. it's your average person that's all they know like yeah. They just know that well, I just want to go in. For, it's like an experience more than it's a specific workout that's going to lead them to a desired goal. I right. remember feeling pressure as a new trainer when I was early on in my career where I felt like, oh, OK, I got to do something new today. Because 100%. We did that workout. That was what time. I always did. I, I remember before a client walking in, writing programs and what how I wrote programs was solely based off creativity and trying to get them sore or teach them something new. Like yeah, that, that was, sells well. Yeah, it does. That's because they feel that, right? I knew that if I did some weird tricep angled exercises they'd never done before, I'm I'm gonna hit a I'm gonna hit a fiber they have not moved in a long time, <laughs> and it's gonna get sore. Yeah, sore yeah. And they're gonna feel the next day, and they're gonna be like, "Dang, bro, you got me yesterday." You know, and I'm like, <laughs> "Okay, resign time." You know yeah. what I'm saying? Like that was really. That's how we trained. It was not, it, which is ironic because we all read the books. We all have all the certifications. I knew better, yeah. But I also was caught in this trap of what sell, what sells, and it, what what gets people to come back is that feeling that they get from a new shocking mm-hmm. workout on their body. But it, when when I really went, and, and it took years, okay, it took years of being a bad trainer doing that to finally becoming more structured about it, and then realizing, wow, when I stick a client. In, in a specific phase. And you just got to fight through, you know, if this is a trainer listening right now, you just got to fight through the the common things that you get from clients, which is, well, we did that last time. Mm-hmm. You know, we already did those. Can we do something different? You know, because you're going to get that. Yeah, That's yeah, what yeah. you get. And, that, and I fell into that trap. Yeah, a well, client would say that to me and then, okay, next time they came in, here we go. Swiss ball balancing one leg up, fucking skull crusher, <laughs> super set it over to a reverse cable kickback. You know what I'm saying? Like, uh, you're doing all this shit. I've just, done that exercise. No, absolutely yeah. done all this weird shit that you're doing just to appease them when you know damn well that that's not what gets them the most results and you just got to be okay. And that's, I mean, we have a very, very low uh, re- return rate for an online program. Um, some of the best I've ever seen numbers wise. Yet the thing the, the the number one thing that we will get when someone wants a refund on the program is they're normally somebody who has not listened to the podcast for a really long time and understand that we share how we build all these programs. And that's what they're looking for. They get the program, they open it up, they're like, I've seen all these exercises. Yeah. I've I know what it's cool. Why yeah. I, I thought this was gonna be different. I thought it was gonna be stuff I'd never seen or done before. There's no like, Superman push ups. Yeah. <laughs> right? yeah. Where are they? Right. <laughs> it's it's because these are the best movements and they've been around for a very long time. But we've we and I say we as in myself too included is guilty of fucking everybody up by teaching all this weird shit that, you know, we want to impress as, people. As with. a trainer too, but you know, your clients don't be afraid. Your clients will actually love seeing themselves get better at exercises that they're they've been practicing well, you just s- as much. You say this a lot, Sal, really well, which is, you know, stop looking at, you know, exercise like that and you're and you're trying to figure out the, you know, the sweat and the mirror and the scale from it, but look at it as like a, a skill that hey, I'm getting better at that That's movement. Right. Like that was I was really shaky the first time, and my form was really off, and I, I didn't feel comfortable. And like I'm feeling more comfortable, and I'm dropping in the hole better. And I, you know, because yeah, at first I used to like really wow clients with just different shit all the time, and mm-hmm. then as I learned, 
I would wow them with, you're getting better at these things that we're practicing. And I would tell them like, okay, Mm -hmm. I know for the last four weeks we've been doing kind of this heavier type training. Now I'm going to move you into what's called supersets and we're going to do that for the next four weeks. I'm going to get you good at that. And that's how we would, I would block my training and they'd get way better results. And people like to see themselves progress at things that they, that they've been practicing. And it's actually better than, than always, you know, mixing it up is that practice. But like anything, like anything, the, the whole variable muscle confusion principle, whatever you want to call it, that also can be abused, and that's what we're talking about. It, it can be taken too far to the point where that's all you do all the time. Bodies don't progress that way. They just don't. They don't progress well that way. It takes no. too long to get good at something, to get real, to really reap the benefits. I know I, I, we were watching a, 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 long, a while ago, I think it was like two months ago, uh, uh, Instagram uh, post by one of our good friends, Ben Pollock, who's... Uh, Strong dude, uh, incredible physique. I was just watching his videos uh, this morning. Beast. Yeah, super strong dude, super uh, incredible physique. Uh, great guy too, really nice guy. Crazy amount of squat, you know, squat weight that he can lift. 800 pounds. He was just Crazy watching his 800 lift. pound squat. Yeah, yeah, insane strength. Yeah. Like two or three months ago, he posted a video of himself doing backstep lunges. And he said in the, in the in, underneath it, I never do these. I've never, like I've, I haven't done these <laughs> in years. you can see it. And he had 135 pounds on the bar. Yeah, which guy for, who squats 800 pounds. Yeah. And you could see that he's struggling, not because the weight's heavy, no. but because he never does, does that exercise. Now, what do you think will happen to a guy like that when he sticks to the backstep lunge well, and practices it? Well, to your right. point, again, okay, and, and think if he only does that once or twice and then moves on from it. Not a lot of benefit going to come from that. No. None. And if you compared it to your 800-pound squat... And that's all you were comparing it to. Like, yeah, of course that that movement doesn't. You got to do that for a good four to six weeks minimum, especially get good at it. and get good at it before you start to see major. This was, uh, I, you know, what movement uh, taught me this more than anything else, aside from knowing it. But really, did I see it was Bulgarian split squats. Yeah, I remember oh, you yeah. doing that. You went through a, a great equalizer. Them. Oh, it, well, and you know why I stayed away from it so long because I was I couldn't I couldn't hold. You know what pissed me off was at the time <laughs> my girlfriend that I was dating could could do this them better oh, than no. me she had better mobility super ego check and she had already done bulgarian split squats all the time because she wanted to build her butt and she's over there with 20 pound dumbbells and i'm like shaking like a fucking leaf doing that 10 times and i'm like i don't want to do this yeah you know what i'm saying so i bailed on squat it. yeah <laughs> so i bailed on it and yeah. it wasn't until i really worked on my mobility performed the movement better did I really start to get good at it? Then I was starting to challenge it. And then I was getting to the point where I'm putting 100, 200 pounds on my back and doing that shit. And my legs just blew up yep. from that. And what's cool, when you find a, a great movement like that and you practice it like a skill and, and you get a, boy, the gains come on. Like it reminded me when I was new. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, the gains that I saw from that one movement, it was, it trumped all the stuff I've been doing for three, four years that I'm hammering away at the gym. So that was something that also changed how I would approach some clients. Like, you know, I get a client in and they struggle with the squat, like really bad. Like just mobility is not there. They've, it's a skill they've never done before. They're weak as fuck. And instead of me as a trainer just doing that for two or three sets, moving on and then doing all these other exercises that they can do really well, I began to dedicate the entire hour around the squat. Get we would do something, I would assess their movement, mm-hmm. could tell them why they're struggling, why their ankle's rolling in, why their knee's collapsing in, why their chest is falling forward, why they can't pull their shoulders all the way back, and then saying, okay, the reason why this is uncomfortable here is because you can't pull your shoulders back here. So I want, these are the moves that are going to help that. And then I'd get on the, I'd get on the ground or on the move and I'd show them that. And then we go back and we do a, a set. And then I'd show them how they feel better. And then I would pick another part of their body part that, they, that was breaking down. And then I'd say, well, let me show you what movements will help this and get that better. Then we go back to the squat again, see how that's improved that. And I would just, the whole hour is all about the squat and, and getting them to understand where their body is breaking down, the things they need to do to improve all those little areas. And that, that workout ends up being so much better for that person on so many levels mm-hmm. than me going through as a trainer and, oh, they don't do that very well, so let's just do some leg press mm-hmm. and leg extensions and leg curls and some other movements. Yeah, one of my favorite things to do um, and has been for a long time, one of my favorite techniques to get my body to respond is to find a movement that I suck at and then get good at it. Yep. And give myself that was pull-ups for me. Yeah, yeah. Was, really? Yeah. Yeah, so for so like I just recently experienced it well I, I rec- I've experienced it a couple times now um, more recently. One was with windmills. 
couldn't do them, was terrible at them. Got myself to the point where I could do them with a 80 pound kettlebell. And man, my core, my stability and my core for when I deadlift, you know, weight, whatever went through the roof. Then the other one was a, a snatch grip deadlift and a snatch grip, grip, uh, snatch grip uh, high pull that we did in Map Strong. Yeah. And my upper back. And I remember when I first did it, I'm like, I suck at this. Yeah. I'm going to give myself about five weeks. I'm going to practice this, get good at it. And so that's, that's really the key is to, you know, yes, you want to mix things up. But you want to give yourself enough time to get good at them. And so it's funny because the, 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 the thing that I wrote in that post was almost everything works, but nothing works forever. That's even true for mixing shit up. Mm-hmm. You see what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Like even mixing stuff up, that works. But if you do that the, the too body much, adapts, it work. The body yeah. adapts that too. Right. That, was, that was my problem was yeah. I got good. I got in some of the best shape I ever did in my 20s. And it was through this muscle confusion you know, ideology of training and I saw great results. And because in my head, I'm changing exercises, I'm changing reps, I'm doing all this, that I'm all my body's always trying to change. Well, the problem is I've now taught my body that, that this is how it's going to yeah. get curveballs all the time at the yeah. gym. Just survive. It's never going to yeah. get great at anything. It's going to be pretty good at everything, but never great at one thing. And that, too, causes a major problem. I, I remember, too, it was early on and when we all first met and you had dedicated an extend, extended period of time at getting good at deadlifting and squatting. Yeah. And this was already when, you know, this is already, Adam, when you were already a pro. You'd already been competing. You'd already been training for a long time. already had an amazing physique. The difference in your legs and back, and you couldn't see with your legs because you have to wear board shorts when you compete, but you sh- you would show us. Your legs grew like an inch and a half or something silly like that. Oh, which, it was more now. It, it, it was it, crazy. It, it was like it, maybe more like two inches, right? Yeah. Or more. And that's an insane amount of muscle to add on somebody who's already been training for a long time. Your back didn't look like the same back. There was one picture you posted, and this was all from why all from not changing exercises, but practicing and getting good at the deadlift. Your back looked like a different back. It didn't look the same at all. But that's why I remember I brought up the other day where I, I got in that debate with Danny about the different movements, oh, and I'm yeah. like, dude. And I know, of course, this is my experience, but that's also my experience with all my clients, like that I've trained and and since then. You know, people that I've helped out, like the the deadlift, the the amount of carryover of getting good at that skill that played in all the other exercises. And I'll I'll never forget that that day of heading back to the seated row after not doing a seated row for like six months. I mean, that was a staple movement. You see me in the gym carrying my jug, headphones in, wrist straps hanging off my thing, head over to the seated row. I used to love to stack that thing, you know, get up to as much weight as I could on that thing and, you know, rowing away. And that was like my my staple back warm up. And then I would get into all my other back exercises. And I had a decent back because of my shoulder to waist ratio. And then I totally eliminated almost every back exercise except for deadlifting. I just got good at and, and at all the variations of deadlifting. I should point that out too, because I was doing snatch grip deadlifts, which was a, a, a major mm-hmm. one for me too. And I remember going like, you know what? It's been like six plus months since I've grabbed this seated row. And I grabbed that stack and moved that weight like I had never moved it in my entire life. And what blew me away, of course, the weight I was moving blew me away. But it's like this was an exercise I was really good at. I was really good at the seated row. I did every single back workout for years and years and years and slowly watched myself, you know, inch up 15 pounds every year or so. Maybe if I was lucky of hammering away at it. And actually, I was able to eliminate it, lift, dead, get great at deadlifting, revisit it, and I was way strong. And I noticed the same thing with my hamstring curls. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that was, I was, all, I, I've always been a puss when it comes to lying leg curls. I've just never been able to do a lot of weight. My hamstrings have just, so it's a weaker muscle. It's a very vulnerable position. Yes, too, right. Right. <laughs> right. So, you know, you I, spot? I'm barely, I'm barely okay. moving 70, 80 pounds on that thing. And, and, uh, I've never been good at it. I, t- I totally eliminated that in there. And just from the, the deadlifts had so much carryover that my lying leg curls and my seated row were like, you know, increased by like 50% on both of them. Yeah. Insane. And, and not doing them. I just blew, blew my mind. Yeah. It's absolutely insane. I, I'd say, you know, it's, I don't. I don't like to say you know, uh, with a word of caution. Okay, there's a lot of individual variants here, but I'll say this: your rep ranges should probably change any anywhere between every three to six weeks. Your exercises should change anywhere between 
two to six months. That's those are the longer ones. You keep the exercises. Your tempo of your reps can change when you change your reps if you want. So right around the same time, three to six weeks, where you kind of change the the tempo. Um, and every I'd say at least two or three times a year, change your goal. Um, you know, I, I mean, if you follow the MAPS programs, it kind of works out that way because you're able to go from one program to another. Each program is usually three to four months long. So if you follow a whole year of programs, you're going to follow anywhere between, you know, three to four programs. Um, and so that's the, that's why we wrote them the way we did. And the idea is to keep your body uh, progressing, to avoid the plateaus, because aside from stopping working out, um, plateauing from poor programming is probably the most common reason why people's bodies just don't change when they work out in the gym. They just don't change anymore. And I'll, I'll take it one step further. If you're somebody who already owns one of our programs, the program that you're least likely to do or want to do will probably be the best thing for <laughs> of course. you. Yeah. As much as you hate to hear this. Painful to, yeah. But if you were to scroll through our, our complete library of, of extra, extra uh, programs, the one that looks the least appealing to you is probably the one that will give you the most amount of results. Yeah, if you're the power lifter and you're looking at maps hit and you're like, oh, fuck no. Yeah, right? fuck no. <laughs> Try that shit out. Watch right. what and vice mother. versa. If you're somebody who has hit and you loved hit, but you're like, strong man, I don't want to look like a strong man. I don't want to be a strong man. I don't want to train. That That program will probably do the most for you. Exactly. So. And so with that, look, go to mindpumpfree.com and check out some of our free guides. You can also find our individual Instagram pages. My page is Mind Pump Sal, Adam is Mind Pump Adam, and Justin is Mind Pump Justin. Thank you for listening to Mind Pump. If your goal is to build and shape your body, dramatically improve your health and energy, and maximize your overall performance, check out our discounted RGB Super Bundle at mindpumpmedia.com. The RGB Super Bundle includes MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, and MAPS Aesthetic. Nine months of phased expert exercise programming designed by Sal, Adam, and Justin to systematically transform the way your body looks, feels, and performs. With detailed workout blueprints and over 200 videos, the RGB Super Bundle is like having Sal, Adam, and Justin as your own personal trainers, but at a fraction of the price. The RGB Super Bundle has a full 30-day money-back guarantee, and you can get it now plus other valuable free resources at mindpumpmedia.com. If you enjoy this show, please share the love by leaving us a five-star rating and review on iTunes and by introducing Mind Pump to your friends and family. We thank you for your support, and until next time, this is Mind Pump. <laughs>